Hello, this is Turbodog702 with the final section for this Parasite Eve submission commentary. Uh, we are using the PlayStation TV menu to switch the discs for this game. Uh, you're going to see me go into the menu again to verify that I am on digital control mode as well as this loads up. But uh, then we're going to continue on with the run. So Eve has already inseminated herself to get prepared to deliver the ultimate bean, and she has decided to basically gestate inside of the museum, the National History Museum. So uh, what is kind of nice is that we did have, if we have extra parasite energy at the beginning of this, it's actually really nice because the first encounter inside of the museum is one of the most dangerous. Uh, the museum is going to be a drastic increase in the damage, but also the experience that we gain. I mentioned earlier on that there is a drastic increase to your statistics. Uh, you'll start to see that as I get through the early parts of day two here. Uh, my health will jump substantially as I get my first few levels. So a little bit of a sequence break here. Uh, you are intended to follow the shadowy figure, who's obviously Clamp, uh, to the left wing of the museum. But you actually don't need to do that. You can actually continue forward. And by doing that, you bypass a bunch of fight triggers that you would normally have to deal with. Of note, on the right here is a little pedestal. That is a quiz platform. Uh, if you do quizzes, you can get items. If you do a certain amount of quizzes, you can get better and better items. Uh, in a marathon run, I would have the answers to the quizzes with me so that if I felt especially low on items, I could do the quizzes in order to get a buffer on items. So this is the scorpion. Scorpions are dangerous for a number of reasons. Um, their melee attack is quite fast. They do a lot of damage. They have an acid spray that is a huge AoE. And they have a tail attack. The tail attack is very fast. It covers a large area, and its hitbox is ridiculous. Uh, it will hit you from places that make no sense. In addition to that, it also has a counterattack. Uh, every time you hit it, you notice that it's attacking with its tail. Uh, that is a counterattack that it will always do. One of the most dangerous things that can happen with scorpions is if they use their tail attack... And then you shoot them in the middle of the attack, they could potentially attack twice with their tail instantly. And that's basically a kill on you. So not great. Luckily that fight went pretty well. We also were able to get enough Parasite energy earlier on in the fight to use Haste. Haste makes that fight and that enemy considerably easier and more safe. Uh, we were also able to get a little bit of Parasite energy to use on Heal 3. So because we have Random on our gun... That makes these fights considerably rougher, too. Um, whenever we have to fight these kind of gecko monsters, they come in relatively large numbers. And that can make random... Like, the more enemies that you have to deal with with random, the worse it gets. Uh, in the original route, we had what was called spread, or burst. It's a shotgun blast that shoots a cone of damage with every shot. But more importantly, it would get rid of the random function, which would then allow us to aim our shots... Uh, burst excels in fights like this, where the enemies group up and you can do damage to all of them. Uh, unfortunately, on a average case scenario, it's still faster to have random with this ATB build. Uh, I will say that this is probably one of the places that I least like the changes to the route. That and the centipede fight. But, you know, it's not about what you like in a route. It's about what's actually quick and effective, and turns out that, by and large, this is still the better option. So those geckos can drop junk, so I want to try to get rid of that pretty aggressively. Uh, enemies inside of this area drop medicine threes and fours, and I want to try to get as loaded up with medicine fours as possible going into the end of the game here. So we have to go into that side section in order to have an item from the upper floors fall down and break. Otherwise, our path is blocked. So now we're just going to use the ice bullets to fight 
these, uh, they're called armadillos in the game, but I don't know why armadillos would be in the history museum that's dedicated to dinosaurs and ancient cultures, but whatever. I always thought they were roly-polies. Or pill bugs. So once we hit a level up that gives us 561 total HP, we will be able to use a full power energy shot to kill uh, raptors instantly or armadillos. Uh, shout outs to Primus for tipping me off on that, is that's a pretty substantial thing when you have to deal with random. Because again, your positioning becomes really important with random and hedging your bets. If you can eliminate targets, you try to eliminate targets as best as you can. Because the more targets you eliminate, the better random becomes. You're noticing that I'm not really manually reloading the machine gun, and that's because it takes more time to manually reload it than it does to just let it reload in combat. Uh, the exception to that would be if you wanted safety against bosses, which is why I reloaded it before the centipede encounter. So this is pretty much going to be the last fight where we can't use energy shot. So one nice thing about armadillos is they're relatively easy to manipulate where you want them to go. Uh, once they start, or once they pick a direction and start rolling, they'll continue to roll until they hit something that stops them. So that is one saving grace, is that while that can be annoying to get in range of them, you can also kind of manipulate them where you need to go when you need to finish the battle. So still quite not at that 561 HP range. After examining the video, I think I probably still should have used Energy Shot on the Armadillo here. Even though it wouldn't have killed him, it would have reduced, again, the targets that we had to fight. Uh, once we got a single shot on him with the gun. That and we aren't really going to use uh, Energy Shot against this particular Pterodactyl. Yes, Pterodactyls. Pterodactyls and Armadillos and Geckos and Raptors. But did you know that the star exhibit for the National History Museum during this dinosaur exhibit is a T-Rex skeleton? Boy, I hope we don't have to fight one of those. He said. Small detour there to get the medicine for. Again, we just want to get as much medicine as we can heading into the end of the game. As you can see, while our HP jumped quite a bit, the damage that enemies are doing is quite high as well. So uh, pterodactyls have a number of attacks. That stair attack actually does darkness if it hits you, so it's important to carry around a couple of cure darknesses as well. They also have a melee attack and uh, eye lasers. Yes, eye lasers. I said it. So even though there are hot spots inside of the museum, uh, places where you can get extra encounters, you do, again, want a couple of extra encounters. Uh, the main goals of day five are to, well, the main goals of disc two, day five, I should say, are to get access to a weapon off of one of the bosses and then turn it into our weapon for the end of the game. Uh, they're to try to efficiently combat enemies using energy shot and coping with random. 
And our more important goal is to get enough experience so that we get access to the Liberate ultimate ability for Aya. Uh, liberate is the most powerful move in the game. It does like 1500 damage that's split up among multiple attacks. And it is integral to gain access to this before the end of day five. Because after you get through day five to the last bosses of day five, you do not get any more experience. So very important to have access to Liberate before we leave the museum. This fight can either be a scorpion and a pterodactyl or the two raptors. The two raptors is actually a little bit better because we can insta-jib one of the raptors like this. Also, scorpions, as mentioned, are pretty formidable and dangerous foes on their own, so... So Clamp's office is off to the right here, but it is actually locked and closed right now. Uh, the reason we can't just climb up the stairs inside of this place is the security room has initiated a lockdown inside the museum that has closed off all the elevators and all of the stairways. So we're having to kind of wind our way through in order to make it from floor to floor. Going underneath this overhang to get access to a tool. Kind of stuttering around a little bit here. Getting the defense one there isn't what I wanted to do, but it's also fine. It doesn't hurt. So here we're going to use up some of our Medicine 3. Medicine 3 is actually fine, but again, we really want to get extra room for Medicine 4s. We also do need to pick up some other items uh, during the course of making our way through here. So, because of the fact that there's only two enemies here, I'm going to use an energy shot to get rid of this armadillo right away. What that's going to allow us to do is focus all of our fire on this pterodactyl instead. So this next fight can be potentially pretty brutal one way or another. You can get a bunch of raptors and a pterodactyl, or you can get a pterodactyl and a scorpion once again. Uh, this is the worst encounter as a result, since you can't really get rid of them super quickly. Yeah, the scorpion was giving me a right frighten as he was deciding to do absolutely nothing. Which he'd be like, well, he's doing nothing. Isn't that a good thing? It's actually terrifying. Because you don't know what he's going to decide to do. Another big thing is I mentioned how the hitbox on the tail is pretty erratic. The damage on the tail is also erratic. Uh, for example, there I took 54 damage from a tail strike. Uh, I have seen that, that tail strike do 151. <laughs> So, when the variance of damage is 100, that's, uh, it's not great. It's not great. Of note, 150 damage would also be enough to completely bypass our CM vest and kill us. At this point, we do have a revive, though, so that's fine. Of note, if we did lose our revive in day two, uh, there is an additional revive inside of the pharmacy at the start of day three, and there is a revive inside of the museum here. I believe if you do enough of the quizzes, you can also get a revive off of the quiz things, but that's more than I would want to do. We take the secret element inside of the security floor after opening up the security lockdown and take that to get a tool and a shotgun. There's also a machine gun on the left side of the screen, uh, there is a theoretical route that we need to try where that machine gun could have a very, very niche use at the very end of the game. But now, who likes Jurassic Park? Hmm. 
This is basically, basically the plot to Jurassic Park. All right, so we're introduced to the next major boss that we're going to be fighting. But for now, we got to go ahead and make our way over to Professor Clamp's office. Now that the security lockdown is done for, maybe we can make our way into there. So unfortunately there, I did get hit by the blindness effect. However, I had enough parasite energy that I was able to fire off a shot and finish him off. So I was able to ignore that. And sure enough, inside of Clamp's office, find my Ada. He's doing more research. I check my inventory one more time here because we need to pick up two items inside of this room. We need to pick up Maeda's gun, which is a special gun that he made that is useless to us at this point. And in addition, we also are going to be picking up Clamp's key. So my age's gun is actually extremely weak when he gives it to you. But it is a plot significant item that you cannot break, you can't really modify. Cannot throw it away either. So yeah, kind of need it. Meanwhile, they're talking a little bit about the uh, result of the movie and the story before this game. Meanwhile, Clamp's like, No, Eve was right all along. Ultimate Bean. Yeah. And Daniel gives him some nice little chin music there. Tries to attack Aya with a scalpel. Kind of hitting the uh, major plot points here. Clamp talks about how humans are all garbage and we're ruining the planet and we're basically parasites and destroying the planet around us and this is just the natural evolution of things. The planet is using mitochondrial Eve to get rid of the parasite that is humans. Blah, blah, blah. Evil scientist talk. But, uh, now he's going to give himself up to the cause and tell Eve to uh, attempt to use him as a weapon against us. Luckily, Daniel and Maeda jump out of the building. By the way, this is on like the second floor. And the first floor is substantially large, so... It's pretty miraculous that they're fine. Maybe there was just... A canopy that they landed on or something. Regardless, we're fine because mitochondria. We're going to take the clamp key and continue on. That's going to access the few doors that are still kind of locked off to us. For example, we've already been in this room, but we couldn't exit to the left because we did not have access to the clamp key. 
Now we do. Nice little no encounter in that room as well. So in the upcoming room, there's actually a battle skip. Uh, by hugging the right wall, we're going to bypass a fight with a scorpion. If our experience was bad and we had really poor encounters, the second time we make our way this way, we could potentially fight the fight with the scorpion in order to fix our experience and continue on with the game. There's our little encounter skip. It's actually funny, on the left side of the room, there's like a prehistoric chocobo. So now we're going to fight the mini-boss of the museum, the Triceratops. So we're kind of going over our stuff, making sure we're using up everything that we need to. Again, now that we've gotten enough ATB, we're investing in damage on our gun. Get rid of items that we don't need as well. I thought about it again and realized that I didn't need the paralysis cure either, so I got rid of that. So things about the Triceratops. Uh, Triceratops has a lightning attack that you can dodge most of the time by standing on its front leg shoulder. In the first form, it has a charge attack. This charge attack does a lot of damage, and he can chain the charge attacks. And even though if you might dodge the first one, if he does two or three, you're probably going to take additional hits. So we are going to do our best to use a full strength energy shot here to speed up this phase. As you can see, a lot of damage coming out from that. So we took three charges and basically took 300 damage. Uh, very important to rush this first phase, not just because of the charge attack, but also he has additional defense on his head phase. Energy shot ignores defense as well, which is why it's a great option for it. Now that we're at phase two, considerably safer, but we still do need to respect the damage that the lightning attack can do. So that was a pretty quick fight for the Triceratops. So I'm going to use the BP that I did pick up inside of this fight. I'm okay with continuing on here without healing. The reason for that is you get a guaranteed heal on your HP when you drop down here. So in the old route, I wouldn't have to worry about this. I pick up these two boxes, though. One of them is a medicine. The other one is ammo. And I do that just because even at the end of the game, I haven't been looking at my ammo specifically. And there's always a concern that even at the end of the game, you could run out of ammo. Uh, that being said, my ammo count is really healthy at this point, so I'm feeling pretty good about that. But uh, again, for marathon safety and D-Russ, always good to be safe. So now we're going to fight big boy T-Rex here. T-Rex has a variety of attacks that you can do. Um, he has a very, very wide range flame breath. You're going to see a lot of those over the course of the fight. Uh, he has a bite attack that has a really irregular hitbox, similar to the Scorpion Sting. can do upwards of 200 damage a hit. The Flame Breath can do up to 150. Uh, he can jump around the map to become evasive. The best thing you can do is try to get behind him or around him when he does the Flame Breath, but that isn't always an option depending on his positioning, such as here. Uh, there isn't a guaranteed safe spot for this Fire Breath. You're just doing your best to try to avoid it. Uh, he has an energy pulse that he can do that shoots multiple energy rays at you. Uh, that's pretty dangerous. There's an example of his bite attack. That bite attack also lingers for quite a long time as well. Using an energy shot here again to bypass some of the defense, do some extra damage. Um, our ETB being good means that we don't really need the haste as much. There's an example of the damage Bite can do. Bite just did 172 to me, and there wasn't really a ton I could do about it based on the positioning.
And uh, that's most of the attacks that T-Rex can do. Uh, he typically won't do the multiple ray attack that I was mentioning until he's low on health. But you still need to respect that that is an option that is available to the boss. I kind of get stuck in the corner here, and so I take some extra combat damage, or contact damage. But uh, it's not the worst. I would much rather take contact damage than take like a frame flame breath or a bite attack. So that was a pretty darn quick uh, T-Rex encounter. We have to make sure we pick up the M8000 gun off of the T-Rex, particularly with this build. Um, the M8000 is going to be the gun that we use for the rest of the run. Because of that, we're going to break our micro Uzi and put its ability stats into the M8000. We're also going to put the burst effect on the shotgun that we got in the first or the fourth floor onto it. So now we have a handgun that has shotgun spread and has very powerful shots due to breaking the micro Uzi. Another nice thing that the M8000 has is M8000 has the two times action ability. That allows us to input two full actions on every round of combat. So we can do that, use that to shoot twice, cast two spells, use an item in an attack, use two items, any combination of two abilities. Um, there are a couple things to keep in mind with that that I'll cover as we get to them. But being able to double your effective damage or healing or whatever you want to do at any time is invaluable, and that's why we use it. Originally, we used to break that gun and put the two times action on the micro Uzi, but ever since implementing the freeze bullet strat, uh, that makes it... We don't want freeze bullets against the final bosses of the game, and we have no real way of removing it effectively. So because of that, we have to invest into the M8000 instead, which is a bit of a shame, but, uh, you know, you deal with what you can. Its actual base stats are pretty good as well. But uh, I digress. We're going to go ahead and confront Eve, who is now well on her way to delivering the ultimate being into the world. So if there was any real content warning that I could say regarding this game, it would be in this upcoming scene and in the final eve fight um there is some nudity involved however i do not feel like the focus is on the nudity um and i feel like it's understated so i don't think that it should be a real consideration as a deal breaker for this game but in the spirit of full disclosure i will mention it Eve's on the other side. Oh no! Yep, that's a that's a pregnant monster with like nine arms. So not a ton happening inside of the scene, basically. She's just like, ha-ha, I'm going to win. Ha-ha, I'm going to make the ultimate being. And you're like, no, you won't. And she's like, yes, I will. And you're like, I'm rubber and you're glue. And... Anyway, she runs away uh, using basically the mass of melted flesh that used to be the audience at Central Park. Time to uh, see the best walking animation. Look at that walk cycle.
And this uh, mass is just going to Kool-Aid man this wall and uh, attempt to protect Eve. And take her to someplace safe to have a baby. That place is going to be... I think it's Ellis Island? Wherever the Statue of Liberty is. I'm going to head in that direction. Meanwhile, Daniel and Maeda are sitting out here like, Oh, we're so useless. I wish we were the main characters. So this is where it's revealed that uh, Aya's sister, Maya, was the one that was given the transplant to Melissa. And that transplant seems to be one of the reasons why mitochondrial leave exists. She's got her kidney, sorry, not her liver. So now the uh, military's got to step in, now that there's a giant goop monster. Time for round two. Scramble the jets. Call Captain Skyhawk. Screw it. Call Captain Power, too, while you're at it. They probably hang out together. So now we're going to have a nice little uh, military intercession. Against the goo monster. But as we know, just like any good Japanese giant monster. Not really movie. Any encounter that the military has with a giant monster in Japanese media never turns out great. So, uh, time for this goop to shoot some laser beams. So we're very quickly closing up on the end of the game. I mentioned that we, at this point, are never going to get any more experience now. So as strong as we are now is as strong as we're going to be. So because of that, I took a little bit of time before entering the Eve Room to distribute my points and get set up. Uh, we also have access to the Liberate ability. I guess I can talk about that a little bit. Uh, as I mentioned, Liberate is an ability that does multiple attacks, each doing a huge amount of damage. Uh, the targets of the attacks are randomly chosen among available targets. Uh, it also uses your entire Parasite Energy Bar. Um, while Energy Shock can be used with any amount of Parasite Energy, it just does more the more you have. You have to have a full bar for Liberate. Uh, after Liberate, you do enter a stun state similar to Energy Shot as well. So because of that, I mentioned we have a two action. Uh, because of how you get stunned, it is more beneficial to use your first action to shoot or do something else and then use Liberate if you are going to use it. Uh, otherwise, it is wasted time on your ATB. Maeda now says that he wants to give you something else. Everybody assumes it's a lucky charm, but it's actually... The, uh, the magic bullet, as it were, to deal with this threat. But uh, nobody believes him. They just kind of shake it off. So now they have the military has a counter strategy. Which is they're going to go ahead and send Aya to deal with the threat. They send an escort with her. 
And uh, they realize literally that the only way that they can beat Eve is through Aya. So uh, they are going to initiate a very tried and true strategy. Or strategy. Uh, this strategy is known as the Meat Shield. It's also the Conga Line of Death. Where they will basically form a line and hope that their bodies can shield Aya as she makes her way over to the target. So, yeah. Brave helicopters going down for the cause. Now, uh, Aya going to take down the big goo monster. So she's going to shoot a nice little tactical missile here. Blow up the goop. But in the ruins of the goop, danger still ducks. Statue of Liberty going to be brought down in dramatic fashion. It's not over yet, though. It's not over. It ain't over till it's over. And we notice that Eve is still alive. Do you notice something about Eve? Maybe, uh, maybe she's a little lighter than before? So it's time for Aya to get serious. Jumps out of the plane, rather helicopter, parachutes down like an action woman. So yeah, I mean she's still bulbous, but uh, doesn't really have the belly she had before, does she? That's odd. Still looks appropriately grotesque, though. So mentioned more kind of nudity, but once again, very understated. Not meant to be the primary focus. You aren't supposed to... I get the feeling that the sexual stuff here is meant like it is in Silent Hill, where it's meant to be a method to cause unease rather than to be anything remotely close to arousing. So this version of Eve, there's two phases. First phase has multiple targets for Eve, which is why we ditch random and get the spread shot. That way we can deal damage to all of the pieces of her at once. Um, we need to be very careful about how we approach her at any given time. Uh, we don't really need access to haste necessarily in order to dodge these attacks. I make a slight movement error and that allows me to get grabbed here. 
At this lower health, I actually am trying to get hit again in order to proc my CM vest. Unfortunately, that wasn't a big enough hit to do so. So I'm doing a little bit of a gamble, but at the same time it's fine because I already had a revive still. And if push came to shove, then I could forcibly heal myself. Big old crazy attack happening there. But uh, we're very quickly going to be moving into phase two. So in phase two, there's a little bit of luck involved. Uh, depending on the crit you have, you could prevent her from doing uh, her big explosion spear attack. Unfortunately, I don't get so lucky in this, so it ends up eating up a medicine and a little bit of time to watch her special animation for that. But uh, that being said, you're going to get to see your first look at Liberate here. So if we got good damage on those two shots and a reasonable ATB, we might have been able to finish off with Liberate. Fortunately, such was not the case, so we had to wait for that animation. But that being said, should be enough damage to finish her off. This is Liberate. So by liberating her own mitochondrial power, releasing the barriers, opening the chakra doors... Aya uh, is able to turn into her own mitochondrial bean and hit multiple times for 255 damage. This is going to be enough to finish her off. If it was not, then we could easily finish her off with a single attack like this. So that was literally just due to really poor luck on movement from Eve and uh, bad crit luck as well. But still very recoverable, as you can see. So we're going to be coming into the end of the game... Uh, and it turns out that the ultimate bean was actually dropped off somewhere else to finish its evolutionary process. And we're going to have to deal with that while on the battleship that the military has been operating off of. But first, goo monster. Alright, so as you can see, all of the strategy changes are really picking up in day 5. Huge time gain on that, and there's even more time on the table if maybe I execute a tiny bit better. However, we are going to lose a substantial amount of time on this final day. Uh, you'll see it as I continue on here, but I had to claw my way out of this final fight. Um, I was actually feeling pretty good about my like materials here i was like eh, i'm a little low on medicine so i did take a little bit of a safety strat here i believe uh, basically there's a serviceman off to the left here he can give you access to medicine three four restorative items ammo so for the purposes of a marathon run i could easily hit the guy on the left and get more restoratives before the final encounter there's also a phone there that you can make a save with as well. Uh, nothing really happening here. Wayne's just like, I'll let you rename your armor and weapon. That's for New Game Plus. Uh, New Game Plus, you can take your named armor and weapon uh, with you into the next game. But uh, yeah, I have a very rough ultimate bean here. Which, because I had such a rough time here, I've actually considered reworking the strategy a little bit to uh, something that I would consider to be a little bit more manageable. But you'll kind of get to see that as we go here. That being said, I also don't lose my revive. So I always have kind of a backup with that. 
Something to note about revive though is when revive procs and brings you back to life, it brings you back with very little health, no parasite energy, and at no ATB. So those three things together, depending on what the boss is and what their ATB looks like, the boss could technically just hit you again and kill you. So you really have to have him either close to death so that you can just shoot him a couple times and finish him off, or have an extra medicine that you can pop on your first turn. That gives you enough health that you can survive an attack. Baby Rage! Baby is mad. Can't believe how mad Baby is. So everybody is fleeing, but I know she's the only one that can combat him. Maeda once again tries to give her the magic bullet, but Daniel's like, we don't have any time for that. It's time to go. But that will become relevant later. Look at this drunk baby. Trying to start fights. I'm only just born, but I'll kick your ass. And then just face plants on the deck. What are you looking at? First phase, ultimate bean, uh, has a pulsing attack that does a fair amount of damage. Has an explosion attack that does huge damage. Uh, basically enough that it will almost guaranteed proc a medicine from you. So, if possible, you want to try to not have that happen. That being said, not always possible. Just depends on crit luck and the enemy's ATB. And this time I was able to pick it up before too many things happened. So this is the strategy I might actually change up. Uh, traditionally, we used haste in order to fight off this second phase and use the spread shot to get to split. Once it's split, you want to focus on the body section while dodging the other. Um, there is a newer strategy that's come out that is supposed to be somewhat better. Uh, it revolves getting the enemy to split. And then after it splits, using liberate in order to finish it off. So the problem is I got relatively poor luck there. Uh, he used his worst attack he could have in his first phase, which is a homing attack that does huge damage per shot and shoots multiple times. Then it also meleeed me immediately upon splitting. So what we really want is for these attacks to hit the body portion and not the flying wings. And this is the problem, is you can't aim liberate. So four out of the six attacks landed on the wings portion. <laughs> So, those wings are dead, but I also didn't kill the thing I actually wanted to kill, which is far more important. I also don't have any Parasite Energy with which to engage him with with a haste. Slight misplay there, I should have healed using the medicine before I shot. Uh, because of that, I ended up using a medicine 4 uh, when it did melee me. So because of that, all of those things stringing together, I am now kind of in a critical place when it comes to medicine. Uh, I only have, I think, two medicine fours. And at this point, I actually don't know I have two medicine fours because it was below the first page of inventory. So at this point, I was running under the assumption that I have one medicine or no medicines. So at this point, I was doing my best just not to get hit. So third ultimate bean, that second hit of the punch is pretty difficult to dodge if you don't have haste. Very important to get underneath the enemy here in order to avoid this attack.
So I knew that those were going to be attacks that were potentially going to occur. It's here that I check to see if I have any extra medicine. Uh, I realize that I have two medicine force. I'm feeling pretty good about this. That will very quickly let change as we continue on. So I know that I'm safe for one more attack, because none of his really attacks can stop me from dying here, unless he did that. Since he did his explosion attack, <laughs> I was like, okay, forget this. I'm just going to use Medicine 4 and hit Liberate. If Liberate kills here, great. If it doesn't, then I at least have enough energy that I can survive the attack, and it'll maybe proc my other Medicine 4. Um, at this point, though, I am a at a critical juncture. Uh, ultimate being 4 is kind of rough um sometimes ultimate being four hits you none other times he does what he does in this encounter which is he hits me a bunch and i'll kind of talk about that more as we get to it but for now we're trying to finish off ultimate being three so yeah this was a rough fight and i do want to examine this fight a little bit more to figure out perhaps some more stable strategy or just return to the old strategy instead either or so ultimate being four creates a bunch of crystals each of these crystals can shoot lasers the lasers basically instantaneously shoot and they somewhat track you depending on how good they track you and how much they desync their shots makes this either a nightmare fight or an extremely easy fight i use haste in an attempt to try to move around as quickly as I can. Um, this is the fight where the machine gun inside of the museum might actually save time. Uh, that machine gun shoots, I think, up to five times. And since you're guaranteed to only do one damage here, uh, being able to shoot multiple times while it makes you stand still might actually save time in the long run to just equip it and then shoot. You're bound to tank a shot or two when you do that strategy, but it still might be faster in the end or more stable. But as you saw there, I took a significant amount of shots, and because of that, I had to use heal inside of there. Uh, not really a lot that I could have done there, to be completely honest. Now my Ada reveals that he has access to a special clip of bullets. Uh, those bullets have IS cells in them, and those cells can cause massive degradation and mitochondrial abominations like this one. So he's going to give Aya a clip of bullets with her own cells inside of them to use in Maeda's gun. You know, that gun that I said that was weak before? Well, not so weak anymore. Uh, we have to shoot him eight times with these bullets. Uh, and the gun shoots twice per round. So we need to survive to shoot him for four rounds. Which, considering we have no medicine and kind of middling HP, is kind of a rough prospect <laughs> like normally this fight is not nearly as scary as it is here but i just had really poor luck when it came to the first few phases and then extremely poor luck on this one as you can see here i got hit for 162 and i realized a double hit could potentially kill me here so i actually gave up some time to heal but uh yeah that gets us through Ultimate Bean. So yeah, we lost a considerable portion of time on this final fight, but uh, very irregular as well for us to lose that much time. So both of the losses that I'm going to get um, at this end split and on day three for Shiva are not typical for a speed run. So definitely a run that I can improve more. But I figured this was a nice look at kind of backup strats and... What I think is the most interesting thing of RPGs, which is what I call the scramble. Uh, this final sequence is another place that's a casual killer. We need to guide this thing through the ship. Inside of the ship, there's two split paths. You have to pick the right path each time. If you pick the wrong path, you die. But uh, other than that, it's just knowing which way to go and leading the monster to the boiler room, where you will then detonate the ship and destroy it. But uh, yeah, just, so one of the big things is like, why do people watch RPG speedruns? And speaking for myself, I think the scramble, as I call it, is the reason I watch. 
RPG speedruns are by and large very, very structured, um, very methodical, very consistent, based upon strategies that you can readily duplicate all the time. The most interesting, or some of the most interesting things in speedrun are when I see an RPG speedrun and the strategy doesn't work. Maybe the enemy dodges an attack. Maybe an enemy survives longer than it's supposed to. And then you have to go to the backup plan. Now here's the thing. What happens when the backup plan doesn't exist or the backup plan doesn't work as well? That's when you have to see people do the scramble. It's when you have to see people test their metal, test their th thought process, and really show both their game knowledge, game mastery, and their ability to keep cool and collect it under pressure and create a game plan on the fly. Uh, the ability to quickly hedge your bets for success. That's the most interesting thing in these runs. And that's why I kind of decided that I wanted to keep this run to present as a submission because it shows that struggle that you have when things don't go your way and time. So this is a recently new timing development. Uh, we decided that we should change the timing to when you exit the boat. This is the last point at which you can actually die in the run. Um, that being said, there's about three to four minutes of extra scenes for the actual ending proper that I think are reasonable to watch for a marathon. Uh, that's another reason why I am bumping up the estimate to about three hours, 10 minutes. Uh, so that we can watch this and to provide for safety saves and possible issues that happen inside of the run. Uh, but yeah, with this new timing method, we also don't have to watch seven minutes of credits to get a final time. So thumbs up for that, right? But uh, hopefully you guys have enjoyed this submission commentary for Parasite Eve. Uh, hopefully I'll get to see you guys at some marathons and I'll continue to push this game a little bit more. We're going to go ahead and watch the ending here, which is going to see Aya revisiting full circle an opera at Carnegie Hall, reproducing the one that she saw at the beginning of the game. We're going to see them have some kind of funny scenes and maybe a little illusion at the end of it that maybe not everything is resolved. But uh, that'll have to get saved for a new game plus run for those people. Uh, hopefully you enjoy it. I'm going to go ahead and let this play out. Enjoy. <laughs> 